afternoon, everyone. Uh, the Hardy survivors. At the end of the day, I hope it was a good day. Uh, my name is Scott Pearson. I'm the executive director of the DC Public Charter School Board. Um, thank you all for joining us today, and thank you um, to Fight for Children. Thank you to Discovery Communications for uh, letting us use this this great space. Um, as the charter authorizer, our job is to make sure that um, the schools that we approve have the very best chance of success. Um, part of holding schools accountable is providing them with the tools that they need for success. And we think we do that through our monitoring and our oversight process. The beautiful thing about charter schools is that each has its own unique approach to teaching and learning. That's what makes this sector so special. Um, so, but we recognize that there are times when all schools face the same challenges. And one of those times is now. The implementation of the Common Core represents one of the biggest shifts in expectations about teaching in a generation. As we talked about in the last Ahead of the Curve conference, um, the Common Core brings with it demands for deeper reasoning and comprehension, for argument-based writing, and mathematics rooted in problem solving. And as I think most of us are experiencing, that implementation is not easy. Uh, but the promise is great, and all of us at PCSB and Fight for Children feel a responsibility to continue to support you in this important task. I hope you've enjoyed the workshop so far. We hope you've learned a lot of useful information. And we know that it's also helpful to have opportunities to collaborate with one another as well. So we've set up this closing session to allow you a forum through which to engage the full group in a conversation that is relevant to each of you, communicating with parents and community members. We're fortunate to have Brandon Bastide, the Executive Director of Gallup Education, with us to provide you with the latest results of public opinion polls in regard to how Americans view uh, public education and the Common Core. And we also have Helen Westmoreland from the Flamboyant Foundation, who will help facilitate this large group discussion and hopefully in the process give you ideas and strategies to communicate more effectively with your key stakeholders. So Brandon and Helen, thank you for your time and take it away. Thank you. I'm going to be very brief so we can get to the goods with uh, Brandon, but um, I'm incredibly honored to be in the room with all of you here today. Um, and I think you are going to be in for a real treat to hear from Brandon, who, like many of you, has a very nuanced understanding of what we mean when we say the Common Core and what that sets off for others that we are in dialogue with about this transition. Um, so very briefly for everybody, uh, Brandon is the leads the development of Gallup's education work, um, which involves integrating Gallup's research and science on selection, strengths, engagement, and well-being to improve student success teacher effectiveness, and educational outcomes. Um, he is a social entrepreneur, having founded two companies, um, and is a nationally known speaker and author on education policy and public health, um, and a fellow Duke grad, which I'm very excited to say. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. Yeah, there aren't many times in your life when uh, being colorblind is a real problem for you. It disqualified me from uh, being in special forces in the military. So that was one thing. I couldn't, I can't fly an airplane. But on days when you're speaking on a panel and you're sitting in a chair and you put black socks on with a navy suit, it's also a problem. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, in any event, uh, delighted to be with you today. Uh, most of you uh, obviously are are more familiar than the average American about what's happening in schools, what's happening with education. So it's important to start by just saying that any time we do survey research or a poll, when we're talking about a representative sample of Americans, you kind of have to understand it's not this room, right? So uh, simple examples that we all have to remind ourselves of. Uh, the majority of Americans do not have a college degree. My bet is that every one of us in this room, or almost everybody in this room, has some form of a higher education certificate or degree. The majority do not. So, you know, these are all things that I think as we have education forums and discussions, we just have to keep reminding ourselves of. Um, 
Uh, because otherwise you would look at some of this stuff and go, well, these, this is just crazy data. These are crazy results. What are people thinking, right? I mean, we, we have some of that reaction at Gallup every now and then. I'm going to talk about what we've been learning from some of the recent uh, questions we've been asking Americans about Common Core. Uh, it turns out that Gallup, uh, some of you know, has been conducting in partnership with PDK a poll about America's perceptions of K through 12 schools for 47 consecutive years now. So this is um, a, a real American treasure in terms of the ability to go back and look at almost half a century of our perceptions of public schools. Let me just start at a very high level. Since we have started measuring America's perceptions of public schools, our confidence in them has been going down. It's also true, of course, that when we have been measuring Americans' confidence in other institutions, take, for example, Congress or the Executive Office of the White House or the Judicial Branch, those things have been going down, too. So uh, in one sense, we are uh, losing confidence in a lot of our public and government institutions. And so it's not just schools, right, because if I just left you with that data about public confidence in public schools going down for the last 50 years, you'd feel kind of dejected. But the reality is it, they're, public schools, as a, as a confidence measure among Americans, are doing way better than Congress is. <laughs> you all feeling better yet? <laughs> <laughs> no. Now, but so here's another interesting thing, and you know, if you followed Gal PDK poll, you, you probably heard this little tidbit, but when we ask Americans to think about schools nationally, they give them very low ratings, right? So when we say, think about school, public schools nationally, you know, how do you think about them? The average grade is basically like a D plus if we were using the grading system. But then we say, okay, well, how about the schools in your area? You know, how do you feel about the schools in your area? Well, that, that gets a lot better. That's kind of like a C plus or a B minus. And then for those who have uh, children in school, right, we say, well, what about the school your oldest child attends? Well, guess how Americans grade that school? It's like an A minus. So how can both of those things be true, right? How can we be so negative about schools nationally, but yet when we're asked about our own child's school or the schools in our area, we feel much better about them? Here's, I think, some positive news about that is that we actually when we get down to it, if we know the school, if we know the teacher, if we know the principal, we actually feel pretty good about how things are going. But there is a story that has been created, right, in the public dialogue and is driven by most of the stories we hear in the media that is a very negative story about education, right? And it's being fueled in some ways by real data, but for the most part, it's just being fueled by stories and rumors and an idea or a notion, right? Not necessarily what we really know to be true. So I also hope that's encouraging in that when we actually get to know what's going on, we actually feel better about it, not worse. So I'm hopeful about that kind of data. When it comes to Common Core, interestingly enough, and this, this probably won't surprise you, but this data is really stunning how fast it's moved. In 2013, just last year, 60 2% of Americans had never heard about Common Core state standards. One year later, and this, and this is an amazing difference in one year, 81% have heard at least a little about them. That is a huge shift. Here's the problem. Of those who have heard about it, half of them heard about it through the media. They saw it on the television, they read about it in the newspaper or on the internet, right? Only 17% know about the Common Core through teachers. And only 9% have heard about it through communications from their school. You see the huge opportunity here? That when they do hear it, though, through teachers or from their school, they're much more likely to be in favor of it. And that's a really interesting tidbit. So if, if, if you've come to know Common Core simply through the media, chances are you're negative about it. If you've gotten to know Common Core through a teacher or from a school communication, chances are you're positive about it. Now, here's where their difference is. Unfortunately, we somehow have figured out how to turn one of our most important education reform initiatives into a political problem. Because when you look at the support in favor or opposed to Common Core, it is just so dramatically split between Republican and Democrat. By the way, it's even true among teachers. So if we interview teachers, which we've just done, and I can't really share the results because they're coming out in two weeks, but I'll give some tidbits as long as no one tweets them. 
or we tweet down. You can tweet everything else, just not, when I say don't tweet this, just don't tweet that part. That part. <laughs> <clears throat> um, it's like a tongue twister too, right? Don't, yeah. don't tweet this. Anyway, so, uh, but, but here's the thing. If you're uh, a Democrat, 53% of Democrats are in favor of Common Core from our Gallup PDK poll. 76% of Republicans are opposed. I mean, these are unbelievable differences, and they split among party lines. And if you're a teacher who's a Democrat, not, you know, or a Republican, it actually splits among teachers too. So that I find to be just disheartening in many ways, right? Is that, you know, a lot of things in our world have become very political. A lot of things split down political lines. Well, it turns out we've, uh, we've managed to put education in that category now too. So in some way, shame on all of us that it's gotten to that place. So here's the interesting thing. You know, when, when you do survey research, polling, anything like this, how you word questions just makes all the difference. And we all need to be smarter about who's behind the research, who funded it, you know, what might their agenda be, right? Because in reality, if, if we're all being truthful, uh, you could change a word in a question and have that result look very differently. And I just want to give you examples, right? So Gallup is always trying to study this through our own lens. We'll, we'll ask similarly, seemingly the same question one or two words change, and we'll, every night we do a daily poll. We, we interview a representative sample of Americans every single night, 360 days a year. We only take five days off. And so we have the opportunity to test questions. You know, we'll do a split sample one night. We'll ask one question very closely worded to another, 500 randomly assigned to this, 500 that. You can't imagine some of the difference in these things. So the day our Gallup PDK poll came out, I'll read you how Gallup asked the question about Common Core. Uh, the Education Next survey came out, and there, there's differences in methodology and all kinds of things. I won't get into those details, but just listen to the wording and then listen to the differences in what the results are. And think if you're somebody in the media or you're the average parent who hears about this, right? Here's how Gallup asked the question. Do you favor or, and this was, by the way, only for people who said that they had heard about or for, were familiar with Common Core. If you said never heard about it, we didn't ask you this question. Do you favor or oppose having teachers in your community use the Common Core state standards to guide what they teach. So understand the words, you know, in here that are really important is teacher. 60% are opposed to Common Core state standards when you ask it that way. Okay, so, so the Gallup PDK poll came out and said, majority of Americans are opposed to Common Core state standards. Well, I mean, through the wording of this question, do you favor or oppose having teachers in your community use the Common Core state standards? Here's how the Education Next survey asked it. And by the way, neither one of these is wrong. Both of them are right. It's just a difference in how the question was asked. This one's a little more wordy. As you may know, in the last few years, states have been deciding whether or not to use the Common Core, which are standards for reading and math that are the same across the states. In the states that have these standards, they will be used to hold public schools accountable for their performance. Do you support or oppose use of Common Core standards in your state? 53% support. They're literally the opposite answers. The Gallup answer was 60% opposed. The Education Next answer was 53% in favor. And here's the important thing. Americans hate the idea that we will tell teachers what to do in their classroom. Okay? I mean, they, they just generally, that's what changes that question. We're still asking about Common Core State Standards. The other ones, guess what? We love accountability. We, don't we love account? Everybody's in favor of accountability. Accountability, yep. We, I mean, we want to hold everybody accountable, but we don't. Re we don't really get very clear about what we mean by that, or like what things we're actually going to hold you accountable to, or the things we hold you accountable to. Do they really matter? We're holding a lot of people accountable to a lot of things that don't matter, and, and so th there's where accountability can become a huge problem. So I say this to give us all a little education. The words we use in these questions change the meaning and the feeling and the essence of them. And so really, in reality, if you know some of the trigger words, and it's not that Gallup was trying to create a trigger word. I mean, we, this is a Gallup PDK poll. What's PDK? It's a, it's a teacher association, right? So we're always interested in asking questions through the lens of teaching and the teaching profession. So it's not like we were trying to come up with a pro or con on Common Core. We were trying to ask an honest question about Common Core through the lens of teachers. And Education Next was not trying to come up with a pro or con answer. They were trying to ask an honest question about Common Core, and we got very different results. So it's hugely instructive to all of us that we have to understand how we're asking these questions. Here's, here's what I worry about, though. So 
uh, as we're talking about Common Core, as we've made Common Core political, as we've seen states jump into Common Core and now states jump out of Common Core and governors leading the charge into Common Core and leading the charge out of Common Core, you know, the average person is just left with this, come on, really, right? I mean, that, that's how probably the average parent feels, the average teacher feels. Um, I, I will tell you that when our, our, we just did a representative poll of teachers and these results will be out in two weeks because we went very deep on questions about Common Core. And I'll just give you one little headline. Teachers who have already started using it feel pretty darn good about it. Uh, the ones who haven't are, have lots of emotions. They have anxieties, they have fear, they have worries. All the things that you, any of us in any profession would have if something hugely different was happening in our profession, right? You're scared, you're intimidated, you're a little excited, you're nervous, you're... So we even ask questions about their emotions about this. But those who have had experience with it, on whole, feel pretty good. Unless, of course, they're, they're Republican or Democrat, and if you split it that way, <laughs> they just, they're just very different in their opinions of it. Um, but, oh, by the way, this won't surprise you, none of the teachers want Common Core to be used anytime soon to hold them accountable. <laughs> so, so you see, they, they kind of like it if they've had some exposure to it, but no, don't hold me accountable to how my students do on this. And, and very few people are excited about rushing into the immediate assessment of Common Core, right? There's a lot of support for the idea that, hey, let's, let's do this thing, but let's just cool our jets a little bit on how fast we rush to the hold everybody accountable on this. Let's give us some time to actually implement this right before we jump immediately to the how we're assessing performance on it. So those are little nuances that are important. Here's what I'm worried about, though. As a result of all this and the, and the, you know, the polarization of this conversation, we're losing track, I believe, of, the, of just the pure fundamentals in education. So just highlights real quick from a lot of Gallup research we've done in the last year and a half. We, um, every October, right now actually, uh, we're surveying students in fifth through twelfth grade on their hope, engagement, and well-being. And you say, wow, that, that sounds neat, but why are you measuring those three things? It turns out uh, the way these are measured, hope, engagement, and well-being, those three constructs together account for a third of the variance of student success. What do I mean by student success? I mean grades, completion, standardized test scores. I'm talking about the whole gamut we've, we've tested against. So you say to yourself, whoa, hope, engagement, and well-being account for a third of the variance of student success? We're not measuring those things in schools, right? We're not measuring those things at a district level. I mean, there's tiny pockets of examples, but Gallup will interview more than a million fifth through 12th graders this month. And here's what we know about student engagement. From fifth through 12th grade, every year from fifth through 12th grade, engagement in school drops. So 76% of elementary kids are engaged, 61% of middle school students, and 44% of high school students are engaged. And this is not a kid construct. We don't ask them questions like, do you have fun at school, right? We're not asking those kinds of things. We're asking things, uh, this, by the way, is the most important driver of student engagement. If they say strongly agree to this question, I have a chance to do what I do best at every day in school. Only 48% of kids in America say they have a chance to do what they're best at each day in school. It could be a lot worse, but see, of the 48% who say yes to that question, there's virtually no chance that they're disengaged in school. It's 1%. There's just no chance. It turns out it's, it's a truth for you in the workplace, too, that if I ask you that question about your job, and so, so think of the question, I have a chance to do what I'm best at each day at work. If you say strongly agree to that, there is virtually no chance that you're disengaged in your job. It's 1%. There's really fundamental things that we're losing track of. Just the idea of engagement in the learning process is an important one. Here's an inspiring one for any of you who are teachers. If a student says they have a teacher who makes them excited about the future, it boosts their engagement 30x. Not three, not four. I mean, I'm talking, this is a gain. If you just have one teacher who makes you excited about the future and that, and that kid says strongly agree, it's a game changer. So now here's what I'm worried about. If you want to drive student engagement, what's the number one predictor of student engagement? This is such a simple answer through our research lens. It's just so, what's, I mean, it's teacher engagement. All right, so, I mean, we can throw a lot of things at the engagement thing. You know, we can, we can stick devices in front of them. I'm not, I'm not being negative about technology by any means. I, I ran a, an online education company before I came to Gallup. I'm a 
I'm a huge fan of the value of technology. But if we just think that the simple idea of throwing a, a device at them fixes the engagement problem, we've got another thing coming. It can help, but it's not going to fix it. It's the teacher. It's, the, it's an engaged teacher. And here's the thing that I'm most, most worried about for our country, is that teachers of all professions in the United States, behind coal miners, truck drivers, and everybody else, are dead last on saying that their opinions at work count. You just have to let that sink in for a minute. Whatever we've done as a country that has made that a truth, it, it's kind of shame on all of us, right? Like, I don't, you, there's nowhere to point the finger except every single one of us. The teaching as a profession in the United States is dead last in saying that their opinions at work count. They're also dead last in saying their supervisors create an open and trusting environment. Obviously, those things are very related elements. But so now you say, okay, well, what's the number one way to drive teacher engagement? That's also a really easy answer. It's just a great principle. 70% of the variance of engagement at work is accounted for by who you have as a manager. And in a school, that's a principal or assistant principal. So if you wanted a vision for America, gosh, you just want to be the Silicon Valley of great principles. That'd fix everything right there. And guess what? That doesn't require money. I'm not saying that's easy to do, but this does not need billion dollar capital infusions to fix these challenges. This is a human capital, human resource opportunity. And you can take a great principal and plug them into the least performing school in the country and things will just start to change overnight. You can take a great principal out of the you know, wealthiest school district in the, in the world and plug in somebody who's kind of a dud of a leader and motivator and, and things will go in the opposite direction. So let me just wrap up with a couple things and then we'll go to conversation. So if, if you are, it's a crazy world right now, but let's just get back to what I mean by these fundamentals. Did, did you all hear this story this year about Google? This to me is the most important education story of the year. It was an interview with Laszlo Bach, who's the SVP of people operations at Google. And they were asking him questions about what Google has learned from all their big data related to HR and their hiring. And so he was going on and on in this interview, and halfway through the interview, the interviewer says, well, is there anything else, Laszlo, that you've learned that's interesting? And, and it was kind of like an aside in the interview. He goes, oh, yeah, there is one more thing. He's like, you know what? We found no relationship whatsoever between the grades and test scores of candidates and how they did at Google. What? I mean, you, you OK, so, so let's step back. They're not asking any of their candidates about their grades and test scores anymore. Google stopped. The most admired employer in the world just said, we really don't need to know what your grades and test scores were because they had no relationship with how you do at Google. Now, I'm not saying that we throw out grades and test scores. Do not hear that from me. Should we de-emphasize how much weight we put on those measures? Yes. Yes, we should. Are there other ways to measure success? Yes. <laughs> That's the resounding message here. You know how many people applied to Google last year? This is a great stat. Three million. Really, two million. That's a great guess, though. Two million people. Guess how many they hired last year? 10, about 5,000. So now think about the selectivity of Harvard. Harvard has about 35,000 applicants a year. They accept about, I don't know, what, 1,500, 2,000. You get a yield off of that. Anyway, here the, the point is Google is about a thousand times more selective than Harvard, <laughs> just to put it in perspective. Here's what I want to say about this. There's other things that matter. So, so yes, we, we need to uh, provide tests as measures, right? We, uh, we need to use grades as a way to understand how students are doing. But if we don't have some other measures uh, as part of how we're thinking about this, we're in big trouble. Because I've given you one already hope, engage, and well-being. But here's a specific stat about hope. Hope is a stronger predictor of college completion than SAT scores, ACT scores, or high school GPA. And you're like, hope? Well, those of you who have read Angela Duckworth's work on grit and resi you know, I mean, th these are similar constructs, right? You can measure hope. It's one's ideas and energy for the future. It's a far better predictor of how they're going to do in school and in life than anything else that we've looked at. Um, and so I'm not saying you only measure hope, and I'm not saying we turn hope into an accountability measure, because there's a big difference here. So here's what here's I worry about. I think we've done a marvelous job in the last 20 years building accountability systems around schools. I think what we've failed to do is build engagement systems within them. 
And if our goal was to build engagement systems within them, we would think about the accountability game very differently. So here's just a simple example. Most of the data we collect in education is data that's used as a summative measure for accountability purposes. If I'm a student, I take a test, that score goes up to my district, it's reported to the state and then to the federal government, and it never comes back down in any way that's useful to me. Right? Now, if we thought about some of these measures as formative measures, right, where a teacher or a student or a parent or a principal actually had some information that was actionable on how I can improve or my school can improve or how I can help my student, we have a huge opportunity in this country to provide more measures that are used as a formative tool as opposed to a summative tool. And by the way, you can do both. You could measure districts at a summative level. But I think at some point, there's an interesting line that we might think about drawing where for a principal at a building level, a lot of these measures could be very powerful and probably more powerful if they were just used in a formative fashion for improvement, for understanding how I can get better, what concepts I'm not grasping, how I might learn them different or better than others. So we have a huge opportunity there. Um, and I'll just leave you on this one point. We just reported this a week ago. Superintendents, you know, we get all worked up on how the U.S. is doing on PISA scores, you know, the international test comparisons. And we're not doing great. I mean, I think we're like, I don't know, 20s, 30s on these rankings. It's, it's really not great. But gosh, we get all worked up and we think it's just horrible. 4% of superintendents in the United States strongly agree that PISA scores are helpful to improving their school district. In other words, they don't think it's helpful at all. So great that we have these PISA scores, right, and these international benchmarks, but for the school leaders who are helping us improve or not, they don't think it really has anything to do with school improvement in our country. So um, hopefully that gives you some encouraging ideas around all this. Obviously there is a lot of good that can come from uh, how we're thinking about Common Core. I think unfortunately we've, um, we've made it a conversation about uh, what we're teaching and I think what will get people excited is if we talk really, really what it's about is how we teach. It's a pedagogy. It's not so much content, it's a pedagogy and I, I wonder if there isn't an opportunity there to shift the conversation from we're telling you what to teach to we're giving you a guide and a tool on how to teach better and, and I think that that will take off some of the heat from this political debate that has now become the Common Core. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to having some uh, questions. Thank you, Brandon. I think we'll open it up for a little bit of Q&A before we have some table talk where you guys will get an opportunity to really um, apply some of these findings in your experience today to what you want to talk to with your families and teachers when you go home. Um, but let's take a few minutes if anyone has questions for Brandon. Yes. I think we have. Great uh, talk, thank you. Um, so I'm used to using Gallup in healthcare where we measured employee engagement and we'd ask Gal uh, the 12 uh, questions to measure their engagement, uh, the Q12. So do you use a similar tool with teachers to measure their engagement? And if so, what is the, what, what question uh, controls most of their engagement? Uh, it's a great question. So most people are familiar if, you know, we, we do this for a lot of Fortune 500 companies, a lot of large healthcare organizations, government entities. Uh, we're actually measuring employee engagement for the entire uh, U.S. Postal Service right now. I mean, so, um, and it turns out that, that engagement at a, fundal, at a fundamental level in your workplace is similar. The key drivers of engagement are the same no matter what kind of workplace, blue collar, white collar, not just in the U.S., but around the world. It's fascinating, right? So these are not cultural differences. They're not job type differences. They're kind of fundamental to how we operate as human beings. So uh, to your question, we, we do have districts that have started to uh, have us measure teacher and staff engagement, Montgomery County. Actually, we're measuring every year, we're doing an annual measure of teacher and staff engagement for every employee in the district. We're measuring student engagement uh, through our Gallup student poll for every student in the district, grades five through 12. And then in addition to giving a scorecard to Josh Starr at the superintendent level, we're actually more meaningfully, I think, coaching the principals in each of their 200 buildings on how they can move the needle on those teacher and student engagement measures. And it turns out 
um, that in, in, in highly engaged schools where teachers are highly engaged, the three biggest drivers of their engagement are these three things. In the last week, I've been recognized for uh, work that I've done. Yep, in the last seven days. So it's, it doesn't have to be every day, but if it's once a month, that doesn't do it. So in the last seven days, I've been recognized for, for work that I've done. Uh, in the last 12 months, somebody has talked to me about my progress. And then the one where they're dead last of all professions, my opinions at work count. So in other words, what do great principles do? And they all do it in a different way, right? Because they all have a different style. But great principles, in a simple way, uh, regularly talk to teachers about their progress. They have many ways that they recognize them on a very regular basis. And somehow they make them feel and understand that their opinions count. So it was a great question. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Brandon, great talk. Can you recap those percentages again? You said as, as students progress in school, their hope percentage drops. It was, started with 76% and then what were those numbers? So engagement, 76% in elementary school, 61% in middle, 44% in high school. But if I showed you each grade year, it literally goes down each grade year. The only year where it plateaus is between 10th and 11th grade. And that's simply because that's when the majority of students drop out of high school. Mm -hmm. So the only reason why engagement starts to level off in those two years is because we lost a lot of the actively disengaged kids, which is disappointing. Yeah. yeah. Just gonna make a quick point on that. Those numbers track to uh, corporate research as well on corporations. So there's a company that has a thing called the Organizational Health Index, which tracks employee engagement over a number of years, 10 to 15 years. And the charting of the, that engagement index maps pretty closely to the education index. So. Why don't we take one more question, and then we'll move into small group discussion. decrease the negatives because it just seems the stats aren't sufficient what are next steps yeah. um, well I'll just give you two quick answers in February we released um, kind of a landmark report called state of America's schools it's a it's a free report that you can find on gallup.com uh, just type in state of America's schools if you're having trouble finding it but um I would certainly recommend sharing that widely it talks about all these things, teacher engagement, student engagement, all these different pieces I've mentioned. And, um, and the other thing is that uh, Gallup made a 10-year commitment to offer the Gallup student poll free to any school in America. Uh, you have to do it in October. That's our polling period. Uh, a school or a district can register, so it doesn't have to be the whole district. An individual school can. But um, obviously, we've kind of missed the window because we're running it right now. I mean, it's, there's another week and a half left. So somebody, if they rush to do it right now, they could conceivably do it, but, but next fall to encourage schools that are interested in, the, in these measures, I, I really believe you know we, we are what we measure. And, uh, and if we simply start to care about these things uh, like hope and engagement and well-being, people will find ways to improve those measures. It's not as simple as that, but that would be a first starting position is to actually know how does my school look on those measures, you know, it can galvanize conversation with leadership teams, with parent communities. Um, so those are two easy free steps that I would recommend you know everybody consider in, in some regard. So, you had a mic in your hand, so I'm going to let you go before we go to small group. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was very informative. Um, when you talked to students, did you ask them about their perceptions of the Common Core, and if so, what were the data on that? And then also, have you asked students about their feelings about taking so many tests, and what was the data on that? Uh, we, we haven't asked any questions of fifth through twelfth graders about Common Core. We, we've done cognitive interviewing on that, and they they just they don't really have a good understanding of what it is. We we asked them the question, and I don't think we'd get any real good data out of that, right? If they've heard something, it's probably through the lens of their parent, maybe teacher, but probably more the parent. And if their parents are Republican, they're negative about it. And if they're Democrat, they're positive. That's probably the answer, right? But uh, no, the short answer is we haven't done any of that um, on testing. Uh, 
I can't say that we've done widespread surveying that, so it's not a question we asked in the Gallup student poll this year, but we've done some other uh, surveys of, of students, both college and uh, high school students, where um, th they feel overwhelmed, right? I mean, we, we've created a lot of additional anxieties and stress and a lot of things around that. I mean, our, the college freshmen who entered college this last year, according to the UCLA SERP data, are the most stressed freshmen in the history of their 65 years of measuring that question. Uh, so, you know, talk about great long-term data. Um, there's probably a number of things that are driving that, but I think w what we're starting to see is just take Texas as an example. Uh, it was the first state to run uh, into the high stakes testing frenzy. Um, it's also the first state to kind of move out of it. Now, you know, so they went from, they just passed uh, House Bill 5, and they reduced the number of required standardized tests in the state for 9th through 12th graders from 15 to 5. Now, I don't know what the right number should be, but 15 sounds way too much. Five sounds a lot healthier to me, right? Like some level of testing I think is very helpful and necessary, but 15? I mean, when they told me that, I was like crazy. So one of the superintendents in, in Texas told me that 27% of their school days were spent doing test preparation or test taking. So, so I, I, think, I think people understand testing is important, but I, but I also think there's a general sense among parents, among teachers, among students, that we've probably gotten to a place where it's a little bit of an unhealthy relationship. Not one that we need to end, but, um, but a little bit out of bounds. So I don't have great stats for you, though. Thank you. So Brandon and I will float a little bit while we talk in small groups. Um, Brandon, I think you've raised for us a lot of interesting points about the relationship between engagement um, and some of these perceptions of Common Core and testing. So what we'd love to do is for you guys at your tables um, to think if Gallup were to come to your school community, right, and pull 100 of your parents and 100 of your teachers, maybe you don't have 100 teachers, but say 20 of your teachers, um, and ask them some of the questions uh, that Brandon shared with us today about their perceptions of the Common Core. And let's add in there the transition to park because I think that's very real on people's minds right now. Uh, what would they say? Why don't we take about five minutes at your tables to talk about that? I think for many of them, they're concerned about rigor, meaning that it's too much, and that their students won't be able to achieve to that level, and then what will happen. And I really think this is really our nation's next conversation about class. Um, because I think perceptions in middle, middle, upper middle class and upper class families is a very different conversation than the families we serve. We're actually thinking about it now. What is that going to look like for parents? So really thinking carefully about what kinds of questions parents might have, what might their takeaways be. And I was very interested this morning on the panel discussion where one of the panelists was talking about the Tanner University around the Common Core in um, partnership with Johns Hopkins University. Mm -hmm. So I want to speak with her further to see if we can get some ideas from her. Right. Yeah. folks just the question about how does the Common Core affect students with disabilities particularly those that are in non-public placements um, and teachers feeling apprehension about well how do I take this very rigorous very challenging material and making it meaningful for my students in purposeful ways and then in more of the traditional um, light I think we have done our best to kind of quell teachers um, confusion frustration apprehension um, so I think they would respond pretty favorably to the survey like yes I'm ready to go I think the one piece is I'm ready to go but I don't know where I'm going so there are still kind of a lot of questions regarding when is it going to be offered just two weeks ago the window for the PBA changed and we built a school calendar around the window being one particular date and now it's a different date so our curriculum thus has to change and things are now being realigned um, so whenever that little, we get the 
authorization codes, our kids are going to take park and they're going to do just fine. Um, but I think the apprehension is there's still a lot unknown about readiness and when things are going to be offered and the accountability for such. So are you still tier X or do you become tier Y? And um, how do you then message that to families? So picking up on that messaging to families, did any of the other tables talk about who is actually sending the message about Common Core to your families? If anybody in your school, how are they hearing about the Common Core? Anyone? Mm -mm. All right. How might they hear about it? So let's talk, transition to that and talk for a couple of minutes. Um, the headline comes out, it's six months from now. <laughs> Um, you know, DC just completes its park assessment and things are going very scarily, right? Some of the computers didn't work, perhaps. Um, and now there's a lot of anxiety. Um, so I'd like you guys as school leaders to take a few minutes to think about what is your 60 second response to a parent that asks you, whether it's now or six months from now, why does this matter? Why do we even need to be worrying about this common core? Why is this new assessment good for me? Um, so think about how you want to frame this, given some of what Brandon has shared with us, um, and how you want to respond to your parent community, um, either in the immediate or in the future. So let's take another five minutes to talk about that. Public schools and charter schools have different have different parent communities. You know, it's like you're saying like your parents have not asked at all about Common Core. You know, so it's like in order to get them interested and to want to hear about what Common Core is, like you would have to deliver it in a way that makes them want to know. What's frightening though is what I see on Facebook and the examples they give to denigrate Common Core. I'm like, but that's not what Common Core is about. You know, the, the misinformation. Oh yeah, exactly. So, what, it's so widespread. This is a way to level the playing field for all of our kids, and then it helps the teacher then see forwards and backwards, like what is like what they can do to support them. And it's like a really concrete way to break it down for me. What are you going to tell your parents about this transition to? Uh, the higher standards, Common Core standards. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, what we discussed at our table was the fact that so often we feel like um, teachers and students are not really given the why for why they do something. So um, when we have that conversation with parents about the need to have park or more Common Core standards, it's more about the fact that children need to be critical thinkers. And that's what the, those are the skills we're trying to instill upon them. So whether they go to college or trade school, they learn trade or whatever, they have to be critical thinkers. So if you embrace that, it really doesn't matter. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to leave you with a couple parting words and then let Brandon have the last word. Um, he did share of public school parents, only 9% are hearing about this from their school and someone in their school. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity in the room for you all to frame this conversation proactively with your parent community um, as well as your teacher community. Um, so I would push that challenge forward um, for you as we are uh, embarking on a whole new season of, of standards and, uh, and assessments. Um, and I will give Brandon the last word. Uh, maybe a note of hope and inspiration to finish. Um, so I told you we're really worried about teacher engagement and particularly the items about feeling that their opinions at work count, et cetera. Uh, but here's an interesting one. Uh, Gallup also studies well-being, not just in the US, but all over the world. Um, we're statistically sampling 98% of the world's population every year through our world poll, which is pretty remarkable. But in the US, we have enough sample size where we can look at well-being like we do workplace engagement by profession. 
So it turns out the teachers have the second highest well-being of all professions in the United States, second only to physicians. And you go, well, how could that possibly, right, because you just told me about this engagement thing. These are different measures. They're related, right? Usually people with high well-being are very engaged in work and vice versa, but they're different things. Here's the important point. This is a very important nuance that we have to get right. If the story for America is that it is terrible to be a teacher, we're all in big trouble because two of the three million teachers in our teaching corps right now are going to retire in the next 10 years. We need two million new teachers in 10 years. Guess where they all are right now? They're in our schools. And they either have an inspiring teacher who's engaged and excited about their work, but here's the point. The only bum marks that teachers have on their well-being is in their work environment. Uh, they love their lives. They love what they do. They get a lot of fulfillment from it. They're second highest of all professions in experiencing positive emotions each day, second only to physicians, and they're second highest in experiencing stress each day, <laughs> second only to physicians. So don't think that stress is bad if it also comes with lots of positive emotions. And I would just say that teaching is easily one of the best professions that anybody could go into. If we can improve the work environment for teachers, pound for pound, it is the greatest profession in the United States. And that's what I'd like to leave you with.